uh, we're all set. Let's get rolling on the Clinton Fair. This is the first time I've ever given this uh, uh, presentation, and I've been working like a madman the last two days to make sure I know what I'm talking about. So um, bear with me here. All right. Um, this is John Elliott Fair from Lancaster. And he was the, without a doubt, the brains and the money behind the famous Clinton Fair. He was uh, the president of the Worcester East Agricultural Society, which was a, a, a Worcester County, uh, more farming type of event, uh, much like a Grange or um, um, kind of like the Springfield Exposition, Eastern States kind of thing. That's what the event started off as. He was uh, quite, quite a guy. Of course, Harvard educated. Um, his family is the one that brought the railroad to Lancaster, and that's why the station was called Thayer Station. Uh, you probably heard of the Bird Museum on Main Street, now on uh, AUC property. That was his, all right, the Bird Museum. He was a collector of birds, and uh, that was uh, in later life, in earlier, when he was a younger man, he was into raising thoroughbred horses and uh, race horses. And um, he, he ended up marrying a Forbes from Clinton, and that would be uh, Franklin Forbes, so Franklin Street, uh, Forbes School. Um, and so he, he had money and he married into money, and it, it, tremendously influential. Uh, in, in some ways, like the Bigelow's were to Clinton, Thayer's certainly were to, to Lancaster. And this, of course, is where he lives. The house is still standing today. It's uh, Maplehurst Farm up on George Hill Road in Lancaster behind AUC. Um, that's where he raised his horses. Some of them were nationally known horses. Um, and he, he was quite the, uh, quite the shrewd businessman is what he was. I guess, I'll never know, but I guess back in those days, all the rich and influential people who were in the, the horsemanship field. They all raced their horses in Newport, Rhode Island. That was the place to go. That's where if you bought a new horse, you, you brought it to Newport, Rhode Island, and you raced it there, and everybody else could see what you bought and how it went and how fast it was and all of this. So this guy was, was because he ran the Agricultural Society in Worcester County, pretty much, um, and they already had a, a trotting park, um, the driving park they called it, up on top of Greeley Hill. He decided that uh, he bought a horse for $50,000. So in, in 1889, 1890, that was a lot of money. And, um, and he decided to do something really different. He said, I'm not bringing that horse that everybody wants to see. I'm not bringing that to Newport, Rhode Island. I'm going to race it on the top of Greeley Hill in Clinton. And needless to say, every uh, millionaire and every kind of influential types from down and you know, throughout New England ended up coming to the Clinton Fair instead of going to Newport. And that's how he kind of promoted this whole um, Clinton, uh, the Clinton Fair. So here it is today, and, and I just, somebody asked me thinking I, I would know, and I should have, but I don't. Um, remember, the Clinton Fair started in 1889, all right? And yes, it was on the property that is now St. John's Cemetery. But um, first of all, there was no cemetery there until 1899. That's when they moved the 4,000 bodies from Cemetery Island behind Clinton High School and moved them up to Greeley Hill. So for the first 10 years of this fair, this was just all nothing but a big, huge open field, uh, kind of a plateau right above town, beautiful scenery, uh, fresh air, and so that's how it started. Once the, the, the Catholic bodies started to be buried, I believe, I, I know they came up the back road um, through, um, like, what they used to call Bates's Pit, now there's a neighborhood there, and come in the back way. And, and I think what they did was they filled in the, the cemetery from the back going forward. 
So even by the time this ended in 1915, it's not like people were partying uh, on the left and, and buried bodies on the right. It, it really almost, you know, it was almost two different areas, but that's how big it was. But I do believe they used this big open field that's to the left of the cemetery itself. And I was just up there the other day taking these pictures and I didn't realize that they, they were just putting in a road. So they had been burying bodies on the left side for, uh, somebody said 10 years, maybe 20 years, whatever. But up until that time, this was wide open all the way. Those are fairly new graves there. They really are. So I have a bunch of different pictures. Some of them are on display out there, and you'll see them. Um, but here's the ticket office, and you can see just, of course, the way it was that people, of course, dressed up. You know, today uh, we go to church in our pajamas and things like that, you know, and you go to Walmart in your bathing suit and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there, if it was the fair, it was usually three days long, usually a, a Thursday, Friday, and a Saturday, and you, you dressed up. You know, that was what you did. And you bought your tickets there, probably 25 cents or 50 cents to get in there. There was this big exhibition hall, and again, that's because it started pretty much as a, as a, um, it's like a, a fruit, vegetable, cattle, um, pumpkins, like a true Grange type of show. Not, nothing really else other than that to begin with. And um, so I want to read a quick little passage uh, from that. Uh, this was like the invitation that was in the current back then said, uh, you may be and you should be a contributor. If you have a choice horse or cow or a favorite hog, sheep, goat, dog, rabbit, goose, hen, or parrot, don't be afraid to send it to the exposition. <laughs> exhibition. If you have raised a plate of splendid apples, pears, peaches, or plums, or if your garden has produced a mammoth pumpkin, squash, carrot, turnip, or potato, do not be bashful, but pass the treasures along for others to see and enjoy. Do not allow any of your neighbors to beat you on the lines of cattle, fruit, or vegetables. So they were inviting everybody, and not just from Clinton, of course. This is central Massachusetts. And, you know, come on and, and take part. Kind of in some ways like uh, Mayberry. I guess I've been watching too much Andy Griffith lately, but it was kind of like the, those types of things. You win a little blue ribbon if your pickles are the best, or something like that. <laughs> and here's, a, here's some pictures of the inside of that exhibition hall. You can see these are Apple, but look at the big sign. It says West Boylston. So as a town, they said, here's West Boylston apples. And I have, we have plenty of pictures. And they're the same thing, only the sign says Sterling, the sign says Clinton, the sign says, you know, whatever. Um, that's what they did. Even flowers. If you, if you had the best flowers in your garden, you could put them on display, and who knows, maybe win a blue ribbon. That was the idea of it. And here, this is from an old postcard, and they called it then a cattle show. And a cattle show it certainly was. Um, this is a, an advertising piece. And you can see the size of these things. And they even brought in, I believe, yes, this is the largest oxen in the world. Uh, 8,600 8, 8, pounds. Uh, owned by somebody in Maine. But they, they brought them all the way down to Clinton to uh, show off their, their stock. Now, here's some other things, of course. They had a grandstand there, huge, held 1,000 people. Look at the size of this, and look at the crowd. And, and in the middle was the, um, what they called the oval. Come on. Okay, forget it. Um, anyway, inside here was the oval. So here's the track. It was a uh, quarter mile track, four times around is a mile. And then the inside, was where they might have had special events, special uh, daredevil events, or things like that that I'll talk about uh, in, a, in a minute. 
Here, of course, is the famous Fakers Row. Fakers, Fakers of course, were um, kind of kind of like carny people. All right, um, it was more uh, games of chance, uh, places that you'd probably get cheated out of your money if you weren't careful. Um, and I have a, a, a little article from the item that talked about that particular area. You'll get a kick out of it. If it's a three-legged horse you want to see, he's there. You can see the beauty of the future as foretold by a palmist, if that suits your fancy. The freaks of the land and sea are to be seen. And if you like cider, it's there, or moxie, if you prefer. By the way, we have some moxie right out here. Thank you, Rob Latini. Uh, you can ring a can, which I imagine means the, the carnival type of events. You can ring a can, or a watch, or even a diamond ring. If you are hungry, there's a menu to tempt your appetite. You can listen to the hawkers tell their lies, and it won't cost you anything unless they persuade you that they're telling the truth. <laughs> so they had, this was a great game of chance. Look at this. You see this? Look at this. This is a Hickory Bill, the champion dodger of the world. Now, when I was a kid at the carnival, you could take a, you know, some kind of baseball or softball and throw it at a target. But this kid from Brockton, that was, that's his head right there. <laughs> he was the champion dodger. He had his head out there, and you threw, you threw stuff at him. And he was so good at it, apparently, that uh, he lived to tell about it. Like this. <laughs> and then this other things were uh, weightlifting, little children. Uh, weightlifting, that was another like demonstration in Baker's Row. And the item carried this little quick thing. Hickory Bill has his head with him, and it's just as hard and hard to hit as it was last year. <laughs> so here's more general scenes, uh, huge crowds. Um, and the crowds brought a certain type of crime. Anybody want to guess what kind of crime? Very good, pickpockets. Definitely. And so there were cops, there were special police, there were the Clinton police, and there were even undercover police because it was so common to, uh, to get your pocket picked because of these huge crowds. Crowds, remember, it's a three-day event, but there were, it was always consistently 25 to 35,000 people there in Clinton, coming to Clinton during those days. 25 to 35,000. Uh, they, they had tents set up. For instance, Clinton Hospital had a lunch tent, and uh, the profits made went to Clinton Hospital. Here's more general scenes. There's the moxie. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I shouldn't have said that. There's supposed to be subliminal, subliminal messages. I'm going to go get some moxie after this one. Um, one thing they always did, this was, it's, it's hard for us to imagine, but I mean, this was a big deal, Clinton. It was a big, big deal. And the first day of the, of the event was always Children's Day. And it was so big that they canceled school for the day. All right? Clinton canceled school and Lancaster canceled school so that all the kids could come on that first day, and I guess it was half price or whatever, but the kids would come there. The kids weren't supposed to come on the second and third days. And when they did, uh, I know the item carried an interesting article about the truant officer who happened to go up there in the middle of the day on a, on a Thursday or Friday. And they saw, you know, the, the reporter talked about the kids hiding under tents and hiding in barrels and all that stuff to get away from the truant officer. Like we did with Marty Gibbons, I guess. But, <laughs> Um, here is um, just some advertising. Advertising, and we have some on, uh, on display out there. This was a great thing, and, you know, this gentleman with his little Clinton Fair pouch. It was in every Worcester County newspaper. These are postcards um, that, you know, usually there's a picture of the previous year's event, and then they are promoting, you know, this year's event. You know, that looks like it was like a fake. That's not a fake, not at all. All right, this guy hanging up here in the blunt, it was Professor Fred Owens of the United Airship and Amusement Company. And he would often perform, and that's just a, a, a look down the midway, 
And you can see the exhibition hall, the back of the grandstand, and some of those tents and outbuildings. And look at the crowd. Unbelievable. Here's another look at postcards. It says, Dear friend, meet me at the Great Clinton Fair, September 16, 17, and 18. Great racing each day. The exhibits are fine. You're chumpling. And I guess you can send these out to your buddies. Uh, you probably saw out there the, um, the uh, bulletin or the premium list. We have one from almost every single year the fair ran. The, the thing that you have to make, make sure you remember, though, is uh, the bulletin was like the, um, almost like a sort of a football program. Thick, some great ads, but also it was, it was a preview of what was coming. So you could read some great stuff about all these daredevil acts coming, or lion tamers, or trapeze artists, but you have to go to the item or the, or the current to read sort of what actually happened. And not that there was that much of a difference, but some of these acts, if you had uh, gale winds, you certainly weren't going to you know, go down a chute on a bicycle and try to jump over 40 feet to the next ramp or something. So it didn't always happen like the, like the bulletin said it was going to happen. That, that thing in the back I will uh, explain a little bit, but horse racing was one of the major events. And um, they actually even, I don't think this is it at all, but uh, they actually even had a, a local doctor's race. That was like a little gimmick that they did. Um, they didn't have just horses, it was a horse and carriage, because that's how the doctors made their rounds. So there were probably six or eight doctors in town, and they would line up on the track and race. And from what the papers say, Dr. Bowers uh, was always, always apparently the, the winner. All right, we're going to talk about some famous acts that came here that were truly world-renowned. These people had, had, um, had traveled all over the world doing this. This is it's funny because it looks just like a Clinton setting. This is in a different language over here on the right. But this is Oscar Norman and his wife. And uh, they were high divers. Both of them were champion high divers. And... Um, what they did was there was usually a, um, a, a, a pole, a tower. Um, it says here 120 feet. I've read where some of them were 90 feet. But um, he, would, he would especially uh, dive off the tower, do somersaults, dives, and everything else into um, 42 inches of water. So basically three and a half feet of water he would go, go into it. And he lived to tell about it. Um, but his, his, uh, his uh, final act, his big finale, was, uh, here's a description of what it was. The grand climax of the day was the fire dive. For this act, Oscar Norman dons a pair of overalls and jumper over his tights. And then there is a bound around him a suit of paper with long streamers of tissue. These shreds of tissue are saturated with kerosene. Oh. <laughs> you know what's coming next. Uh, kerosene is then uh, poured upon the surface of the water in the tank, and this oil is lit on fire at the same moment that Oscar's suit is lit on fire. So he dives into this flaming pool, coming down like, I love this, a surging meteor, and with a hiss that could be heard many hundred feet away, plunges into the pool. That's what he did, probably three times a day, um, because that was what they did. They didn't just come and leave. He was, he was contracted to do this probably three times a day. And there's his lovely wife. The only thing about her, it's, it's very interesting, is uh, she must have had a, uh, um, she must have had quite the publicist or something, because they, they her biographers made it sound like she was from Sweden, and when she married Oscar, she was uh, like 13 years old or something. And I think later on they found out she was born in California. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another one, the famous Sedora. Sounds fancy, huh? She's uh, called the, uh, the most daring girl on earth. And you can see what's coming up next. This is just an ad. But there she is on her Indian motorcycle, and
and there's where she drives in that big, huge globe. And here's a better look at her, uh, autographed picture of her, plus her at, I think it was a World's Fair. And there it is. That's, that's I believe, a Clinton picture. And uh, she's, there was a trap door in this globe that was 16 feet in diameter. And uh, she had this little motorcycle, kind of like a mini motorcycle. And she did this act, uh, London, Paris, uh, Berlin, Germany, all over the world. And um, again, this is, this is what she did. And her finale was going so fast that she would be straight up and down, as the people, as the hawkers would say, you know, uh, defying gravity. She was really totally upside down. But she's going so fast around that thing. I don't know how the hell she didn't end up bringing dizzy, but that's beside the point. <laughs> and then, believe it or not, her motorcycle is still around. And uh, I found this online, um, often at, at real fancy classic auto shows across the nation. Somebody today owns that Indian motorcycle that Sedora used in her uh, in her entertainment. Anyway. Okay, here we go with the famous diving horses. <laughs> and it's funny because I did hear a lot of people, you were one, but I heard from many people that were really, I think they thought these horses were, were being totally mistreated or um, whatever. They would dive into water, and again, same with them. They entertained all over the world. The horses' names were king and queen. And they even gave a private showing to the Prince of Wales. Later on, it was King Edward VII uh, in England. But again, all the major cities of Europe and the United States. And they really were. This one on the left is a Clinton picture. That's the, one of the horses just diving in. The other one to the right is uh, diving into the ocean. I believe it was uh, New Jersey or New York, somewhere, somewhere there. And that the thing is that they, they, they really dove. It, it's not like they jumped, but I'll read you this prayer. It says, to the average person, it seems impossible that an animal of that size could dive successfully from such a height. With apparent nonchalance, one of the horses saunters up to the, walk, to the platform, standing almost 40 feet above the heads of the audience. The animal calmly surveys the crowd below and without the slightest hesitation makes the dive. The most wonderful part of the act is the fact that the animal does not jump into the water but actually dives, striking the water with his forefeet. You can see diving in like someone would really dive in the Olympics or something. Uh, actually, uh, they, uh, during the few seconds that elapsed between the dive and the landing, the spectators stand breathless with astonishment and repressed excitement. <laughs> and as the animal strikes the water, almost everybody's eyes close and a shudder passes through the crowd. Then as the horse calmly rises to the surface, shakes its head, swims around, and then a spontaneous burst of applause breaks forth and everybody joins in. The horse seems to take to the feet without a bit of fear and without any urging. And I do know, I don't know about in Clinton, but in a, a show shortly before their Clinton show, they had people from the uh, um, animal treatment group, you know, the, whatever it was at the time, that, that investigated because they were very concerned that these things were being mistreated or whipped. We, no, these, this thing would go up on onto that platform all by itself, and at a certain time, just dodge. <laughs> and no whipping, no prodding, no nothing. And they were trained to do that. The owner had a story that said, uh, um, basically, there was some kind of, in the field where, where there were just little ponies, they would find a way to, to jump off this kind of high plateau into water and then come over to a field that they didn't belong in. And every morning, the owner would go out and see his horses over in this field when they weren't supposed to be there. They were supposed to be over there. And he got to thinking and therefore put it together and uh, made it into quite a money maker. All right, this guy, 
and is probably the, the greatest daredevil that ever came to Clinton. And he came several years in a row. I believe that the name is uh, Schrader, is how it's pronounced. He was the greatest cycle attraction ever witnessed. And he uh, performed from 1895 to 1919. And he ended each performance, this is, a, this is a wonderful lesson to everyone, he ended each performance by calling his mother and telling her that he was safe and he managed to do it. How about that? Okay. Until the last one, which I'll tell you about in a minute. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, what it looked like. This is a Clinton picture. Um, the top of that on the far right is 102 feet high and it was built for him by Clinton people, and he had to inspect it, of course, and the uh, jump-off spot was um, to the far left, that was 35 feet above the ground, and I believe that's him inspecting, which he always did, of course, before his jump, or either that or he's saying something like, you know, like, why the hell am I doing this? <laughs> Whatever. But um, that's what he's, he's doing right there. And this is a much better look. And um, I didn't explain really what he does. He goes down the chute on a bicycle, all right? And the bicycle goes one way, and he dives into a pool. You can see it right there in front of the grandstand, OK? And um, the bike always lands somewhere else, thank God for him. Um, but the real problem was, it was always the case, from the top, the 102 feet, he can't see where the water is, all right? But he has it all measured out and figures out what he's going to do. But when he starts, he can't see the water. And he goes flying down, and then right at the jump-off spot, they say, it's not like it's, uh, it just goes. He actually, like, leaps off his bicycle at a certain point. And then he's almost like Superman. He goes straight, diving into, uh, into this pool while the bike goes somewhere else. Uh, the, the water is four feet deep, uh, the pool is tw 12 feet wide, and it's usually about 100 feet away from, uh, from the, the end of the jump. And I do know the item held, uh, had a little article about uh, the first time he was here, his first jump, uh, all of a sudden he was almost ready to go and they noticed that the water was leaking out of the pool. So they had to call the Clinton Fire Department to get up there and get some water in the pool. And uh, they managed. Question? Yes? Is that the same pool that the horses dove into? I don't know. And I don't think he was worried one way or the other about it. <laughs> so this one on the left is from, I think, uh, New Jersey, a picture. And you kind of get to see not very much, but that's the bicycle, and there he is doing his Superman impression. This is a Clinton picture, and when you take a real good look at it, we have it on display in the other room, that's him that looks like a missile, but I think that's him going straight off, and right underneath is the bicycle. And, um, you know, he did this for a living for almost 25 years. Imagine that, 25 years. And, uh, I, uh, he always, of course, had to, uh, um, he had a standing offer, had a standing offer of uh, $1,000. He dared anybody, I'll give you $1,000 if you, you try that trick. <laughs> Needless to say, uh, nobody was that stupid. But anyway, uh, but anyway, about 15 years after his Clinton performances, uh, he did die doing this act. Uh, May, it was May of 1919. And he did this trick in New York in front of 25,000 people, including his wife and infant son. And uh, he struck the side of the tank and was fatally injured. And uh, they said it was his uh, 2,020 dive. So he had done this 2,020 times before and never missed. And he did this time. And, uh, and he, he actually did it free, too. He was. Uh, uh, very, uh, he was quite a philanthropist too. Many times he would do these three things. Uh, this one happened to be for a Salvation Army in New York. And he did it free. He paid all expenses and he didn't charge to do it. And he ended up uh, dead uh, a day, maybe a day later. Here's another kind that's a little bit safer 
This uh, guy's name was uh, E. H. Honers, and he was called Cyclone. And he was kind of like an evil can evil type, a little bit more than what we might be used to today. He came down a chute um, much lower than, than uh, the last guy and jumped across this pit or whatever to the other side, the other side of the ramp. And this is a Clinton picture of that. So we don't see him going down. That might even be him inspecting right there. But he went down the chute and then went over, not quite like the Grand Canyon or whatever evil did that time. But uh, mm -hmm. And they even had trained monkeys do some of these things. You know, they go down the chute and round and round. Um, we had all kinds of uh, animal acts. Um, of course, that was all part of it. Uh, we had monkeys doing that. The, uh, Hot air balloons and blimps and things like that were really big. Uh, that was kind of a new thing to us and in little old Clinton. Uh, it probably was very unusual to see this kind of stuff that went on. So there was always hot air balloon rides, but there was some really, there was some extra stuff to it, some, some real uh, daredevil acts. Um, they, they would give you rides if they wanted. Um, there was a, a case of a, uh, a woman on a swing under, under the basket and uh, she would parachute down once the, the balloon got high enough. Um, that was a popular thing too over several years where the balloon would go up and there'd be guys who just dive out of the balloon, dive out of the basket, but they had a parachute and they would come down and try to hit a target. Sometimes they'd come down in the middle of the woods. Sometimes they'd come down in South Lancaster. And people would go looking for them to help them and bring them back to the park. So let me read you about uh, uh, the trapeze artist trick. Um, Miss Ethel Heath, Ethel, Ethel did a parachute jump. Shortly after 5 p.m., the big balloon was sent away with Miss Heath seated on a trapeze underneath the basket. The big bag, we're talking about the balloon, not Ethel, <laughs> uh, rose about 1,500 feet in the air, drifting away towards the south because of a slight north wind. There was a hustle by the crowd for points of vantage, and soon came three revolver shots, which conveyed to Miss Heath that the time for her to cut loose had come. And almost instantly, she was seen to drop, her parachute opened, and she came to earth in the open lot uh, right near Highland Street. And within 15 minutes, was back in the park, escorted by a large crowd. Mm -hmm. So this was big stuff. I mean, you can imagine, you know, I think it'd be big stuff to most of us today, probably, that you can imagine, especially the kids from 1889 to 1915, seeing this kind of stuff. Pretty, pretty odd. So air shows were always popular. Blimps, of course, coming across. Oh, this was a famous one, too. Oh, yes, yes. This is, uh, I'll try my best here. Mademoiselle Gertrude Carlotta Pianca. She was the, she was a lady lion tame. How about that? She was from Poland and, once again, entertained all over the world, everywhere. And uh, the lions would, uh, um, here she is right here. This is a Clinton picture. Uh, the lions would, uh, she'd make the lions jump through hoops of fire. And of course, she'd uh, sometimes blindfold herself just to show that she had complete control over these animals. And uh, her finale, of course, was to uh, open the mouth of a lion and stick her head in. Of course, you got to do that, right? Uh, so. It's funny, here's, here's probably the best picture of her right here in front. And this again is a Clinton picture. And uh, the local paper said, Mademoiselle Pianca is not only the original lion tamer, but is reputed to be the handsomest woman in her line of work in the world. <laughs> Which makes me think, how the hell many women are ever <laughs> But she was the handsomest of all of them, apparently. All two of them, or whatever. <laughs> She is, listen to this part, she is blonde, tall, has a splendid figure, and is always richly and attractively gowned. <laughs> and a lady lion king. Well then, of course, there were uh, um, 
aerial uh, acts, high wires, trapeze acts. This is just one of many of them uh, from Paris. Uh, look at these outfits. How about that, huh? This is 1900, too. Um, here's another one. He went, uh, he was on a, uh, a wire 100 feet in the air, and I uh, guess his part of his thing was uh, comedy. He would make believe he fell, or you know, drop and hang on at the last second, or make believe he was going to fall, whatever. Um, again, no wonder 30,000 people or whatever came to these events. This was, this was big doings in the little town of Clinton. Really, truly was. Of course, there were animal acts. We had to have animal acts. We had uh, uh, dog shows. We had talking dogs. We had uh, seals that played musical instruments. Uh, we had dancing bears. Um, even one year, I think it was 1905, somebody brought eight polar bears uh, to entertain Clintonians. So here is the, uh, another look at the grandstand. Uh, on the left, and then on the right, that, that little, uh, looks like a pagoda, was um, the judges' stands. So for any particular event that was going on, whoever was selected to be the judge of the event would be standing there, several of them probably in there, so they could get a better look at, at what was going on. Uh, the, the grandstands were always full. They held a thousand people, imagine that, and special seats in the Grandstand cost uh, 50 cents. And again, uh, I can't emphasize enough how horse racing was always a key part of this. You brought the, the fastest, best horse uh, you could to this place, to this event, because you knew many people would be there and people would be buzzing about you all the time. Um, there was even uh, competitions uh, between fire departments. They called them, the, the, uh, at the time, the fire laddies, but like Clinton against uh, Lancaster in some kind of event or whatever. Um, even, I never saw this one myself, but there was a Lillian Hoffman who performed uh, once up there, I think in about 1910. She uh, raced around the track standing on two horses. So, you know, I think we saw that maybe on TV or in the movies, like a rodeo. This is a woman standing there, one foot on one horse, one foot on the other, dashing down the, the racetrack. Pretty big stuff. And there, look at the, the, how full it was at the time. And uh, you can just imagine, and I, I've said it already several times, but just, just think of the, the, the joy it brought, especially kids, from this town who I can't imagine would have seen too many of, of anything like this growing up. And, and uh, I mean, I should talk, I'm not sure if I've seen much of this, and, uh, and I'm old, but anyway. So here's the, here's the last of it, unfortunately, and I didn't put these in proper order, I should. But 1915 comes along, and I believe that was the last show. And I don't know, I don't know what happened. The end was kind of sudden. But, you know, you had an approaching World War I, maybe nothing going on in 1915, at least for us, but um, maybe the whole agricultural interest started to, to die off. Um, and so, from 1915 to 1922, uh, you still had the driving track there, the grandstands and the buildings were all sitting there, but you'd get an occasional horse race, maybe neighbors or friends, going up to use the park. I believe the Boy Scouts used the area way in the back as some kind of camp sometimes. So the place was used, but nothing like these big, huge shows and daredevil acts or anything like that. So in 1922, um, the driving park went up for public auction. And um, everybody knew that there was only one guy who could probably afford to buy it. And that was still John Elliott Thayer, who had started the whole thing anyway. And he, he bought it for $1,500. And when he did, that, that dissolved the association that he was president of. So in reality, the association owned the, the driving park, but didn't pay the bills at the end. And suddenly, Clinton Savings Bank foreclosed on them, and they went to public auction. 
and that's when John E. Thayer uh, bought it, 1922. So um, Jacob Schamberg uh, bought all the buildings on the site, everything, bought them all. And, um, and so some of the buildings he sold off right away. Um, it is my understanding that, uh, that um, by 1929, uh, John E. Thayer, that's when he sold the driving park to St. John Cemetery. And I, I, you know, you have to admit that somebody at St. John's, a, a priest at the time at St. John's, was thinking, saying, someday we're going to have to expand this cemetery, and here's our chance to grab the land. So um, they did in 1929. Uh, the grandstands were, were kind of the biggest issue, and there was serious talk that they were going to be moved to Fuller Field, and those were going to be new bleachers. For, for football, baseball, and everything. And of course, you saw the pictures. They were true grandstands, solid lumber, and a roof over your head and the whole thing. And they would have been grand. But for whatever the reason, the town didn't have a parks and rec board then, but it had some kind of recreation committee. And they decided, let's not do this. Let's forget that idea. So my understanding is that uh, the lumber was sold off. And I know Elaine's not with us tonight, but she said uh, she had relatives who, uh, who built a cottage over at Bear Hill Pond, and, and, and she knew that the, uh, she heard whatever, that the lumber that built the cottage, used to build the cottage, was from the grandstands. I guess it was really, uh, you know, uh, high quality lumber. And uh, so there's, there's probably houses around town that were built with that wood, there must have been tons of it, obviously. So the, the ending was sudden, it really was. And again, um, St. John's Church obviously now uses it and then began to use it. I don't know how many bodies are buried at St. John's Cemetery, but that area was like the, the center of activity. And in closing, uh, even if you looked at the, the Clinton history book from 1900, Clinton had a big uh, celebration when we were 50 years old, and there was uh, fireworks and uh, athletic events and all these great things that the town turned out for. All of it was held up at the Clinton, uh, you know, the, the, the driving park where St. John's Cemetery is today. There was a baseball game up there, you know, the married men against the single men, and uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, uh, not only horse racing, but also racing almost like a track meet. Anybody could sign up. You could be uh, run the two mile, you could run the 50 yard dash, uh, ribbons given out, and all those kinds of things. So it's an area that, and that's where they fired off the fireworks too, which was kind of close to the hospital. There was some complaining, just like there is today on Facebook about fireworks, come to think of it. But, um, but anyway, uh, it was a, a real center of town, believe it or not, way up there on the Lancaster line was a real uh, hotbed of activities back in the day. So, that is it. Do you have any questions for me? I got a question. Sure. You want to get a light spot? Thanks. Is there any particular reason why it just ended? I, 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 I don't know that. I think there just seemed to be a, a, a movement away from agricultural interests. Um, with a war coming up, it was probably another thing. Uh, obviously, the association that ran it wasn't paying their bills for whatever the reason, and, and the head honcho had to bail them out, and he had the, he had the money, so thank God he did. Um, and again, I think a lot of people question about the, the business with the cemetery right there, but the, I, I don't really think the cemetery was, was probably anywhere near where the fair was. That's how much room was up there. And, and at the end, I think the, the, the park was three acres. And, and even today, there's tons of room up there. As I said, when I went up there the other day, I didn't know they put a road through. So when, as soon as you go up Greeley Hill, the very first left, all that open space, they are now planning it for, you know, there's going to be a cemetery anyway, but there's a road now through, and uh, that's what it's going to be used for. And that's what somebody thought of in 1922. So.
So the, you know, the town line is pretty close. Is, is it Magnolia or Silver Street or whichever one? Yeah, somewhere there. That's why, especially in the early days, uh, they called it the Clinton Lancaster Driving Park. But so it didn't how take much of it was actually yet. on Clinton Lane? I don't know. It probably was like 50-50 uh, or roughly, and that's okay. why the, the double name. Yeah. But, you know, in Clinton, we take it over, so pretty soon it was, it was the Clinton Driving Park. Well, I can't believe the attendance. It's staggering. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Where did they park? Um, <laughs> yeah. They came on the train. <laughs> yeah, parking. It was always there. No, they came on, a, on the train mostly, and um, there was like a taxi service. I think it was for a dime. You could, uh, uh, you know, somebody was there, just like a modern taxi today, Uber, whatever, and you jump into the, the horse and buggy, and for 10 cents they would bring you up to, to the fair. Yes? Um, I, f I forget, but when was the last year of the fair and when was the flu epidemic? Oh, uh, that's, yeah, 1915, and when was the flu epidemic? 17? Uh, 18? 19. 1919. 1919, yes. So it wasn't associated with that. Yep. The only epidemic that ever hit up there was uh, one year they had to cancel the, uh, the uh, cattle show because there was an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease. <laughs> which some people would say still exists today in Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, there's over 12,000 graves at St. John's. Is there really 12,000? Yeah. And that doesn't seem like much when you consider 4,000 came at the same time. Right. 4,000 came from the island behind, behind Clinton High School. So they came at once. There might be multiple people in each grave. Well, yes, that's for sure, right. yes, yeah. Because I know when they moved them, they didn't even know how many were in there. They just kind of threw them all into one, and, and uh, that was in the paper that way. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you.